right, tell me something. Are the New England Patriots more likable or less likable without Tom Brady? Ooh, good question. Oh, man, you're starting right away with, like, you're going for the jugular there. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I go big right I mean, from the get-go. I got to say, flips, uh, you flip that question around, Tom Brady is absolutely more likable without the New England Patriots. Oh, curious. Do you think he'd still be as likable if he didn't win his first Super Bowl that he had away from the New England Patriots? We're going on a wicked well, detour here. No, I like this. I mean, I mean, winning, obviously, you know, it's it's going to make people like. I know. I think, like, for the longest time, for the, like, you know, for like 20 years or so, people thought that. Tom, he was like a, a cog in the machine. He was a product of Bill Belichick. And then it was also like this big debate who has, you know, more credit, Tom or Bill. Mm-hmm. But now he was able to branch out on his own. Um, people are like, oh, hey, Tom. And plus he's gotten like so much more active on social media. Like I actually follow him now. And he, some of his <laughs> stuff's pretty funny. He's entertaining, especially teamed up with Gronk. I mean, that's a that's a mean one too. Oh, combo. yeah. That yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, the whole like throwing the Lombardi Trophy and everything—it's like okay, you you would never see that on the Patriots. On the Patriots, everyone's just sort of robotic and uh, methodical. Like you, you really you feel his personality coming out now. Mm-hmm. So that's the flip side of your question. Um, right now, are the Patriots more likable without Tom? Yeah. And let I me mean, interject. You can't argue with stuff. Like you, you are a you are a Denver Broncos fan, so this is like that's that's a that's a tough question to answer in the first place. It is. It is. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. Like the Broncos have gotten the better of the Patriots on a few occasions, especially in those Peyton years. Um, <laughs> but they have been uh, the cause of a lot of my ire in the past. So I, I'm just gonna still say that I, I don't like the Patriots. I'm just gonna. St- that that's just me. All right. Still fair. fair. Uh, and, and, you know, this question is spurred because the other day was, it was Monday night football. The Patriots were on, you and I were texting. That's hence the, the Red Sox hat. What's, what's your, what's your general take on us sports? Do you follow more than football? Do you follow the, the big four as it were big four of major sports? Well, I'm definitely a big basketball fan. Um, you know, I, my Nuggets, uh, they've been they, – they've been good and they're showing promise, but injuries have just kind of, like, been catching up with them. We're missing Jamal Murray. Michael Porter Jr. is out. You know, we still got Nikola Jokic, who's balling, but, you know, I just uh, – <laughs> it's – you know, ever since they made that conference finals in the in the bubble, like, you know, we were thinking, like, okay, it's just a matter of time, but now – now they're just, I don't know. Hopefully we can come back healthy and like really, really show something. It's still early. So, yeah, you know, um, I don't know. Baseball, I can't get into hockey. Uh, hockey's more of a Boston thing. <laughs> we got cold weather here. We got Even though the abs, the abs are actually pretty good right now. I guess yeah. the abs are pretty good. I mm-hmm. Here. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, uh, switching gears to perhaps a more, anticipated topic we can talk we can talk about bikes um albeit many many months past due this is the first time speaking face to face albeit other side of the country wishing you a congratulations on a very successful career um Uh, thank you what are you what are you most enjoying in retirement and of, of course now we're what six months in so it's not like it just happened yesterday out of boy for those uh, for those of you who didn't who are only listening to the audio portion, I just held up a glass of, of beer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> very good, very um, good. This is Figaro Mountain Brewing beer. Uh, mm-hmm. Just to just to be clear, and as you probably know, Figaro Mountain that was my mountain. You know, mm-hmm. like I don't. I wish I had had Strava throughout my whole career, but uh, Figaro Mountain. I, I guarantee you nobody has ridden and will ever ride that mountain as many times as I have. 
That's why my Strava record might be broken. That I'll be okay with, but I, I, the local legend thing. If I, man, if I had had that thing, even like dating back to 07 when I, I was invited to a Discovery Channel training camp, <laughs> um, that was held in Solvang. I started riding that mountain back then. And then like from 2010 on every winter, I went out there and rode that thing like dozens and dozens of times. So yeah, surely I'm like, I'm probably close to a thousand times I've ridden that. Anyways, I'm going off on a really, really weird tangent. Um, I'm not going to just say that beer is the best part of retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's a big, it's a big, it's a big plus. It's sizable. Yeah. It's important. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, honestly, it's, I guess it's just, uh, I don't know, man. I mean, it's like just everything is just, it's just like this gigantic weight off of your shoulders. Like, uh, like you don't have to wake up and, and ride, even though you don't want to just because you have to. Now it's like, I get to go out and ride and I, and I get to stop when I want to stop and I get to basically just, you know, not beat myself up. Like, um, like if you have a burger or, and you want to watch some football and have some chips and salsa, like you, not that I wouldn't do that before, but I'd beat myself up about it. And now I do it and I'm like, yeah, who the hell cares? Yeah. Uh, accurate. I mean, the the follow up question I had to that is, what are you enjoying most in retirement? Referring to eating and drinking. So I'm glad that your answers do hinge ar- hinge around that because I think I imagine you ask most mm-hmm. cyclists that's going to be their their response. It's like it's giving up the that monkish lifestyle of of austerity and starving yourself. I mean, eating and drinking are so enjoyable. So it's such a shame to not have those things. Um, For sure, but at the same time, it's like. You, you know how like you you do a hard ride and when you're a racer you you feel so hungry but you just don't get to satiate that hunger if you're just kind of on the couch and you're just being lazy and you're like a burger doesn't taste as good mm-hmm, you know mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. i still like to go out there and like uh and and kind of just kind of work a bit like i still ride but i kind of have this like three hour limit. Like I just, I have a hard time going over three hours. Uh Um, but, uh, but it's like, I'll go out there and I'll work for it. But then I'm like, Hey, I get to satiate that appetite. Yeah. 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 Now that's the the three hour window is a very, it's, it's manageable. Uh, you're not bidding farewell to your family the whole day. You're, you're, you're getting a wicked good workout. You can earn that burger and the chips and the salsa. I dig that. Um, and, and, scratching the itch of my own curiosity because i know figaro mountain very well do you think do you think you've done it clockwise and counterclockwise equal number of times or are you favoring one side or the other no the happy canyon side i've definitely done much more probably i would go i would say twice as much as the los olivos side yep 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 Ah, just likewise. because the Los Olivos side, it has it's steeper. It has steeper pitches, but you can't get more than like a five minute section without it going down. So just whenever I was doing my workouts or my efforts, it was too hard to to fit it into those sections. Uh-huh. Whereas you know the Happy Canyon side, you had that fifteen minute section. It would kind of go down on on the dirt, uh-huh. and then you'd have a, a half an hour section. Uh-huh. Um, so you could just fit everything in and it was in a nice, neat little package. Which I've, I've ridden it often enough that I know every gosh darn square inch, but it's, I've also not ridden it enough that I'm still surprised every time. Like when you just said that, that second half hour section, which you're doing in a half hour, that means I'm doing it in 40 minutes. Uh, that thing just goes and goes and goes. You're like, why am I not there yet? And you can count all those little, you can see the corners of the switchbacks. Anyway, folks, if you've never ridden Figaro Mountain, make make it a point because this is iconic and one of the best climbs in in America. Gosh darn it. Um, all right. And probably the, the, the reason that I moved to Los Olivos um, uh-huh. and spent so much time, if it wasn't for that particular mountain, I would have had nothing to do with the San Ynez Valley. Yeah. Granted, they have good wine. They have good wine and nice people and a, and – you know, it's a, it's a cool place to be. But if you subtract Mount Figueroa from that equation, 
Uh-huh. I wouldn't have been there. Well, staying perfectly off topic, there are two very critical things that I don't know if you know that you've introduced me to. You probably know that you've introduced one of them to me. And that's Sarloose and Sons. Uh, I'm drinking that right now. Huh. Very much appreciated. A gift at your wedding. Night. And and so as your folks, as you're making your way to the San Ynez Valley, make sure you go to Los Livos and visit the presumably only wine and cupcake shop in America <laughs> or perhaps in the world. And the other one you introduced me to is Burrata. Burrata? Yeah. I remember my first really? Burrata experience. We were living in we were living in Luca at the time and we went out to dinner and I forget who was there, a handful of cyclists, and and you sort of nonchalantly but emphasize that burrata is coming up next and it's not something to be missed like make sure you try it and it was it was ethereal it's like burrata is not mozzarella there's something exceptional about that where after a nice hard flogging on the bike you 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 enjoy your burrata all that much more so appreciated both of those things hey well hey i'm uh i'm here to educate <laughs> cheers to that okay okay let's let's keep this mildly business related now Retirement is not an easy decision. Um, I retired at the age of 32. You are 32, 33. How old are you, TJ? I'm 33. And, well, okay, then by my math, you retired at 32 and have turned 33 since then. You feel free no, not no, to no. correct that. I, uh, no, I was, I was 33. I turned, well... I guess I was turned 33 in August, so I guess if you want to be really technical about it, my last race was Nationals, so I would have been very close to 33. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess okay, so so more to the point. When when does the, the option to retire, when does the idea of retirement enter your mind? Ooh, um, well... So I've, I've been asked this question quite a bit and I keep changing my answer like every single time Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) because, you know, COVID was a, was a tough year and it was one of those times where like we had this time off. And then when I came back, I just wasn't, things weren't clicking, but if I'm really honest with myself, it happened before that. Um, So 2019 was the year I joined EF and I just kind of had this, you know, things were kind of, I was still good, but I was struggling a little bit and things weren't clicking for me the way they were in the past. And I thought like, okay, this move to EF, it's going to be like a renaissance. And I, I got, I got off to a slow start, but then things started to click and things started to move. And then I crashed out of the tour and I was like, all right, brush it off. Don't worry about it went to the Vuelta and crashed out of the Vuelta. And after that, I was like, things just, it was hard for me to get going again. Like I I almost wanted to just say, you know, forget this at that point. But um, I was like, okay, I'm going to come back in 2020. You know, I, I was strong. I trained well, but I was never really like up at the front. I was more kind of a, just a team helper. And then, and then the pandemic hit and we got this time off and almost that time off. I enjoyed it so much. Like it, it, it sounds crazy. Like, cause I would never, I would never say that, you know, COVID was a good thing. I would, I would never say that. Like, um, I understand like the severity and like the seriousness of it, but, uh, for me, I was, I was really enjoying the time at home with my kids and with Jessica and, uh, and I was enjoying just riding the bike. I wasn't following any training plan. Um, cause I didn't know what I was training for. I didn't know if the racing was going to come back. So I just started exploring some gravel roads. I actually rode some, some roads around San Ynez Valley that I had never ridden before in my life. Like there was a, there's this gravel section of road that goes like up refugio that cuts across all the way to 154 on this gnarly, gnarly gravel section that Mm -hmm. should never be done on a road bike with slick tires, but I did it on a road bike with slick (laughs) tires. I have no idea how I didn't puncture and like, I, I, like, 
really, I should still be up there, you know, like, because there's no cell service. I, I would have been, I would have been completely screwed if, if anything had happened. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I know exactly um, where you're talking about. I've been up there and, and I've been to the, the juncture where it goes from, let's call it rideable gravel to don't go on there or don't go beyond here. So you went yeah. beyond there, which is fantastic. I, I would be on there. Yeah. I, I, I was just like, you know what? I'm going to do it. It's just like 10 mile section of like, I wouldn't even take like a normal SUV on there. You would need a Jeep to drive this thing. Um, or, or more like a Hummer. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, I rode that and like I, I did all this gravel road. You know, okay, on Figaro, we were just talking about Figaro. So you have the normal section of dirt and then you go up and you come to this intersection where normally you take a left to, to go to the top. Yeah. Or you can go straight and you can go down to like the Davy Brown campground. It's kind of a rough road, but I've been down there plenty of times. It's not, it's not anything like crazy special. Okay. You have to go down and come back up. Or you can go right and go on this like super crazy dirt road that takes you like to this other ridge. And then you can drop down all the way to Lake Kachuma. Holy cow. Ha. Huh. And yeah, like, uh, during this time i was like you know what you know what fuck it i'm gonna go right <laughs> like i've never <laughs> been right before in my life uh-huh. if not I'm now never over <laughs> it's amazing man the views there are amazing and i was having so much fun and then once the race program actually came back i was om- it was almost like a oh god i'm gonna have to go back out there yeah and uh and like I just didn't know if I, if it was something I wanted to do, like I had just had such a huge disappointment from the year before crashing out of these races after I had like done all the, the proper preparation and starving myself and going to altitude and being on a volcano and doing all of that. I was just like, I don't know if I want to do that again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, I made it through that year and I was even thinking like, okay, I'm going to, I still want to give this a try, but then it was, it was like I halfway through the Giro of this year, I was like, I, I I'm kidding myself. Like I, I can't do this anymore. Mm-hmm. That was when you say Giro this year, 2021. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then, I mean, that's, that's the, the sentimental heartfelt question. How hard, how logistically hard is it to, to, to retire mid year? Or is it as simple as your heart's not in it, your legs aren't going to be in it, I'm going to wrap up after nationals? Well, the fact that I I was interested in being a director kind of made it a bit easier Mm -hmm. because I said, hey, I said to the team, like, hey, look, I'm really interested in directing because I do think that I have a lot of... During the past couple of years, I felt like I was completely ineffective in races. Like I was not really, I went from being like a really good climber to thinking like, okay, maybe I can be a little bit less good, but I can still be good enough to help out guys like Hugh or guys like, you know, Danny Martinez or Rigo. But I couldn't even really climb with the best 30 guys anymore. Um, So I was like, well... I'm not like a big classics powerhouse guy where I can just like post up in the wind and I can't really climb. Where am I effective? The only place I found that I was effective was in the team meeting on the bus. I was able to kind of give advice or give my opinion or give my experience. And, and I was like, you know what? I think I, I think I have more to give in this aspect. So I don't want to race anymore, but I want to be a director and I still want to be involved. Um, and they're like, well, perfect. Well, where do you want to, like, they gave me the option, like, well, where do you want to stop? And I was like, well, how about I do nationals? And then maybe I can shadow some of the directors in the Vuelta. And then I like USA cycling gave me the opportunity to direct at worlds. And so I was able to gain experience and kind of still be working for the team. Um, so, so it all, it was all fairly easy in that regard. I think had I said like I want to, I want to be done and just disappear and and have nothing to do with it. Yeah, maybe that would have been a little bit logistically. They might have said like, well, we're we're going to need you to fill some roster spots here. Yeah, yeah. But they were they were really cool with it, and um, 
and the directors really brought me on and made me, you know, a part of the group and are, were super supportive. That's, that's perfect. I mean, yeah, to be able to write that kind of exit, right. But still maintain the connections are, are, it's rare, you know, that that's a really cool opportunity. Um, so, so, you know, dozen years in the world tour, what, it's it's hard to throw your mind back a dozen years, but but what changes have you seen in your time in the pro ranks? I'm gonna turn the light on real quick. One second, it's getting yeah, a little dark it. here. Come on. Sorry, I'm on the Pacific time zone, so like sun's setting here. Well, it's probably still like like mid. <laughs> no, I got um, I got a synthetic light here, so I'm faking it back on the East Coast. <laughs> right um so yeah that was that was a great question i was actually uh i was actually thinking about that the way we used to train was a big thing um i remember i mean you were you were living in luca actually we were roommates in luca in 2011 mm -hmm. and i remember just kind of picking a spot like it, what, what was that coffee shop it was called angle Adolce right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that we meet at and it was like kind of the local pros we would meet up and we would do a ride and every now and then people would have like a specific thing that they would do but mainly it was like hey let's roll a pace line or let's race up this climb or let's sprint to town signs and we just we just kind of go out we work hard we hammer we might stop at a coffee shop and we're like maybe someone would do an hour more maybe someone would do an hour less but it was basically like we just went out as a group. We worked hard. We had fun. Now, uh, later on, the training got so specific that it almost seemed like everyone was just training on their own mm -hmm. because it was too hard to coordinate plans like, oh, I have to do this. So oh, I have to do that. And, and so everyone's just kind of isolated in their own plan and not really like just going out as a group which could be good, could be bad, but I do think that that sort of social aspect of it is, is getting a little bit lost today. Um, I don't know. When I look back to 2010, I don't know. Definitely the, the race, I, I'm not going to say that there was no fighting or no tension in the races back in 2010, but I do think that there was more of a method to it and more of a like we fought for times that mattered and now it almost seems like it's a junior race where you fight all day for nothing <laughs> uh i don't mean to laugh because I, I i know in the heat of the moment it's got to be awful but yeah i've heard i've heard that that it's cutthroat all the time there's n there's no joking around it's never been compared to a junior race so that's kind of perfect but <laughs> and why do you suppose that is is it is does every moment count is every is it i always call it square peg round hole every team wants to be in the front and is told to be in the front or like are there moments of relaxation or is it just full gas all day i don't know i mean i, I mean you, i mean i'm sure you remember like when you go to the some of those races early on in the year and you know, the first two guys who attack, like everyone else is like, ah, whatever, that's the breakaway. And it's just two guys. And then you, we kind of chill out for like three hours and then we start a chase mm -hmm. and it's like, ah, oh, it's only two guys. They'll be easy to catch. Now it's like you show up to races where people in the U S probably never even heard of. And most people in Europe probably never even heard of like, um, but it's like still this 80 K fight for the breakaway. And then once, and then the breakaway is like 10 guys. And then you don't have a whole lot of real estate left to, to chase that breakaway. If you want, if you have a sprinter and want to win the stage, so then it's like, okay, you got to start the chase straight away. So it's just always fast. There's never this stage where it's like, ah, oh, let the, let the small teams up the road. You know, they're just here to show the Jersey, like everyone's fighting for everything. And, um, yeah, people show up, like teams show up to the races and, you know, everyone has a purpose. Like 
they want to be in the breakaway. They also have a sprinter. They also have a GC guy. Like you, it used to be like, that's a sprinter team. That's a GC team. That's an attacking team for the breakaway. And now everyone's just trying to get everything. And uh, it's just why that is. I don't know, but it's, it's definitely a change that I it's, it's made racing a lot faster and a lot harder and a lot more stressful. Sure. And I wonder what the, not end result is because the whole sport is, is forever going to be, be changing and, and evolving. It's nice, you know, having lived it, you know, you race any particular race. And like you said, there's going to be the, the hard fought stages for a breakaway. And then there's plenty of stages that, that two guys go and you chill out. It's hard to describe, you know, I retired six years ago. It would be hard to describe, um, how cutthroat it is for those opening two, three hours when it is full gas all the time. Now I, I love in the month of July turning on the tour and it's great because you know, they're, they're showing coverage from kilometer zero and you know, you watch it passively, it's in the background, but the first two, three hours of every single stage are the most entertaining outside of the, the finale. I mean, it's, it's so cool to see the, it's cool on this side of the of computer screen to see that unfolding chess match and who's up the road and who's chasing who and what combination is going to work. But yes, my heart also goes out to the Peloton as is just strung out, lined out. So that's the very long winded way of saying, do you foresee any changes? Like what's going to, what's going to correct it and slow it down? Or is it, is that change ever going to take place? Ooh, man. I don't know. I mean, it's, I, d I don't see it going back to the way it was. I, I don't see it correcting itself. I, I see it as, to be honest, I only see it getting worse from here. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, now as a director, that might not be the wisest thing for me to say. That's not the most encouraging thing for me to say to, to the riders out there, like, Hey, get out there. And uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a tough day. <laughs> You're going to do great. <laughs> and so and tomorrow better be in the breakaway. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, look, I mean, I remember back, uh, when I first started, there were days where it was like, look, today is going to be a tough day, but tomorrow, trust me, it's headwind and it's flat. It's going to be a two man breakaway those days don't happen very often anymore, but before they were more predictable. Like, ah, don't worry. Tomorrow's going to be easy. Just get through today. Mm -hmm. Now it's like every day is like that. And I, I don't see how it's going to correct itself. Um, I, I wonder know. maybe, maybe it doesn't. And then, you know, what are the bigger ramifications? I was talking to Mitch Docker about it and you hear this expectation that maybe, maybe people are just going to have shorter careers. Like you have to come in guns a blazing. You race for a couple of years and you're just going to get burnt out because it's so hard, so stressful. And so instead of 10 plus year careers, you're going to see six year careers as an average. I mean, I think, I think unless something does change, it, the, like you're saying, there's no reason for it to regress. So it's going to be some bigger picture ramifications. Who the heck knows? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, you also look at um, how good guys are at such a young age. Like, yeah. neo pros are coming in just cleaning up, and maybe that's sustainable. Maybe they're maybe they're following a nutrition plan and a training plan, but that that's that's sustainable. But I I can only think that it's. Uh, people come in so hot that they have nowhere to go. And then they're always just going to be looking for the next best thing. And mm -hmm. it's just going to be the short kind of cycle through. Um, and yeah. And with the increased danger and the increased stress in the Peloton is going to come increased number of crashes and every crash like is going to have, it's going to take a toll on, on the body. And, you know, those injuries mount up. I mean, you look at, you know, we were talking about the NFL just a little bit earlier. Like it's, you know, the reason Tom Brady has been able to have such a good career is because they've actually protected the quarterback with the rules more. Mm -hmm. And the reason running backs have short careers is they take collisions every single time. Mm -hmm. um, every single time they touch the ball, they, they get hit hard. 
So every time you hit the ground, it it's it's hard. And the old the more you age, like the harder it is to get up from that. And before it's like, ah, oh, maybe you crash once a season, maybe twice a season. If you have bad luck, you could string along a few. But I remember there were seasons like I go the whole season without crashing. And then lately there's just been crashes everywhere and it's they're harder to avoid. And yeah. when you hit the ground, it's it's not easy to get up from. Harsh. Yeah. I've visited my fair share of race hospitals. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I I was asking about the what changes have you seen in the world to our Peloton? How about you as a person? Like people don't often think about their changes because those those things might take place over a really long period of time or perhaps they have not changed. In what ways do you think you're a different person now in 2021 than, than when you were coming into the pro Peloton and HTC 2010? What, 22 years old then? Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, 2010. Um, yeah, it was like 22, 21, 22. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. I mean, like, like you said, like evolution happens, like you don't notice it so much in yourself. I mean, I think I was, I was definitely, I was definitely cocky. I was definitely like, I wanted to take in every bit of information that I could because I was like so inwardly focused and I wanted to make whatever, whatever I could do to like, just ensure my own success, whether, and that, that might've, that might've helped in some relationships. It might've hurt some relationships. I might've looked at some relationships and been like, ah, how's this going to help me get rid of it? Or how's this, how's this going to help me? Like, oh, I'll, you know, make sure to get close to this guy or person (laughs) or whatever. Um, now I'm during the last couple of years, especially, I think I've been more outwardly focused. Like when I was saying uh, the most effective I felt was in the, was in the team bus. I was more, I was less interested in how can I help myself and more interested in how can I help other people? Um, and you know, and that, that's, that's where I've, that's where I've also come with directing and, you know, that that's my mission there. And, um, I don't know, this sport definitely has ways of humbling you. Um, you come in and you, you think like, okay, I'm the top dog. I'm going to, I'm going to take on the world. And I remember embarrassing myself a few times in the beginning of my career. I remember going into the tour of California in 2011, talking all sorts of smack about how I'm going to like, I'm going to win everything. I'm going to drop Levi and drop Horner and do this and do that. And I got my ass kicked and I was embarrassed. And like people were like having to face the music after that. So you definitely learn to be like, okay, don't count your chickens before they hatch. You got to be humble. You got to give the, give the other riders their respect. And you know, everyone, everyone gets paid to do this at this level. So you got to, um, you can't just assume that you're going to do this because you did that or it. Yeah. Plus you add two kids on top of that and being married for 10 years. It's like, and balancing just life on, on two continents. It's, it's, it, this sport makes you grow up pretty quick. Sure. I'll say that. Well, yeah. I mean, open up that can of worms. I, I, Again, I just had a similar conversation with with Mitch as he's wrapping up his career. He, like you, had the spectrum of going from a single person to married to two children over the course of your career. I went from single person to single person to retired to married with kids. So, so you know, it's that unfolding has taken place after my career. How how on earth do you balance that? Um, I mean, that, that's huge. The multi-continent lifestyle, it's, it's, that's big. You know, like (laughs) I don't have the formula because first of all, I'm going to say it's going to be different for everyone. Sure. Second of all, I'm going to say that 
Jessica and I, we have tried so many different things and we've, we've just had to sort of roll with it. Like we were in Luca and then we were in Nice and then we're like, okay, we should just try to live full time in Girona. Okay. We don't like living full time in Girona. Let's get a place back in the U S and just kind of get a smaller place in Girona. And I don't know it. And it, it was always this running joke. Like every year we're like, okay, that was a learning experience, but now we're going to have a dial for next year. Mm -hmm. And every, after, at the end of every year, we're like, okay, but now we have it figured out for next year. And then it was like, okay, well now we, now we have the one kid who needs to go into kindergarten and now, Oh, now we have a second kid and like, Oh wow. Like, yeah. Shit just kept happening that where now it's like, I guess you just have to kind of roll with it and just, just improvise and uh, make things work as they come, you know, like, and be flexible. You know, <laughs> you try to plan everything out and you're like, okay, we have this race schedule dialed perfectly. You guys will be in the U S for these couple of months and then you'll come visit me here. But then, Oh, I had a crash here and I missed a chunk of racing so now I have to go to all these races when you girls were planning on coming over here. And it, it was just always this, this rolling thing where you could, you try to plan it out perfectly and it's never going to be perfect. So you just have to accept that it's not going to be perfect. And that it's just a, it's a difficult lifestyle to balance, but I mean, at the end of the day, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade anything. I wouldn't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, extremely fortunate that I was able to do this job for 12 years. I don't want to make it sound like, Oh, it was all tough and hard and doom and gloom. Like we, we had so much fun. Like mm -hmm. I had so much fun being a pro bike racer Yeah, and I'm, I'm extremely proud of everything I was able to accomplish and proud to be able to say that I did it for 12 years. But the one thing I won't say was that it was just easy. Sure. <laughs> it's never easy. Yeah. Yeah. How about, uh, you are stepping into a sports director role. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you're, you're doing some of the coaching with the, the new EF coaching program. Are you, are you also moving to Colorado comma? And, and what is the balance going to be like going back and forth to Europe? Like how involved in day to day, week to week DSing are you doing? Well, right now, just in the off season. Yeah. I, like, like I said, I mentioned before about the, uh, I was able to shadow some of the directors in the Vuelta and I was able to direct the, the team at the Worlds. Um, right now, it's just we have a conference call once a week and we're, um, we're just kind of coming up with plans for next year. Um, some of the riders, you know how you're, you're a director and you get assigned some riders where you, have, you establish communication with. I just did a ride with Nielsen and then, also, and then another ride with Sean Quinn. And, uh, yeah, they reminded me that, you know, you shouldn't try to make a comeback because they're a lot better than I, I am now. I suffered so much, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, right now things are, things are pretty quiet. Things are pretty easy. Um, it's going to be kind of similar to when I was a rider. We just have to plan like when there's a break, when the girls want to come over, obviously they're going to have the I'm always going to have the off season. They're always going to have the three months off in the summer from school. And then we're just going to try to plan out weeks here and weeks there when I have a break and when, uh, when the girls have a break from school. But the one thing that I will say will be easier is that I, I feel like my schedule will be more set. Like once I get my schedule, I'm pretty sure that that's the races I'm going to be doing. You're not going to be worried about, Oh, I'm injured or, Oh, I crashed. So, or, Oh, I'm sick. I have to miss these races. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, yeah, that's my schedule. I'll do the schedule. Sure. No, that makes total sense. Or yeah, you could barter it with another DS, but yeah, yeah I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> You're not going to fall out of the car and injure yourself for the <laughs> yeah. next race. Jumping back a bit, your, your first team, you raced for Rabobank Continental Team, and then your first pro team was HTC Columbia. 21, 22-year-old kid, to be frank. Um, and then immediately put in as a team leader on that, you know, HTC Columbia. Like, 
that was the winningest team the year prior. I can't imagine that pressure to be a team leader at the, that point. So, so similar question that I asked a few minutes ago, like trying to put your mind back where you were in 2010. What, what is it like having that kind of pressure as a 21 year old, 22 year old kid in the biggest race in the world saying you're, you're captain, you're going for it. Yeah. I mean, um, so look, I was teammates with Mark Cavendish for those years on, on HTC 2010, 2011. So, I mean, as a Neo pro, like I, I was able to get a few results, but all of that was kind of, uh, everything I got was just kind of unexpected and and kind of this bonus. And I guess, you know, the big result being, you know, I was third at the Dauphiné, uh, my Neo pro year in 2010, which, I think it just kind of came out of nowhere and everyone was surprised and it was completely unexpected. And it was only like halfway through that, that race that people were like, Oh, maybe we should actually start kind of supporting this guy. It, it wasn't like I came in as a team leader. Um, and then, you know, you, you go to 2011 Cavendish was still the main guy, like in the tour de France and in all, in any like main sort of like, races where we're going and we need to produce here it was it was Cav who was he was the one expected to go and, and win the races um there were a couple of times when I really got my opportunity like in tour of California which I completely made an ass out of myself because that's when I <laughs> said like yeah I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna I'm gonna show everyone that you know I'm ushering in the new era of American cycling move over Levi move over Horner and they put me in my place pretty quick. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like those HTC years, there was not really a whole lot of pressure. It was more just like, a, let's learn. Let's not only learn, you know, how to lead a race, but also learn like how to manage the media pressure that I put on myself and be humble. Mm -hmm. Um it wasn't until I got on BMC where it was like, okay, we're, we're going into races and you're our leader and you are like, this is on you now. And even then, like I, I went into the tour that year and Cadell Evans was my teammate and he had won the year before. So I, 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 I had a really successful tour that year, but when you come in with the defending champion, it's not like all eyes were on me. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know. I almost feel like those first three years, they were probably some of my more successful years because I was able to shunt a lot of that pressure away because we had guys who were bigger names than myself on the team. Um, going forward from there, like I feel, I feel like that's when I really understood like, okay, now, now it really is all on me. And sometimes I was able to live up to it. Sometimes I wasn't. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like I, I don't even know if I, I, did I completely get away from your question? I don't even know. No, you've, <laughs> you've, you've answered it perfectly. And, and, you know, you and I were, like you said, we were living together in Luca in 2011. That was my first year with liquid gas. You and I had overlapped previously just the slightest bit in 2005 we were on the u.s national team i was on the u23 team you were a junior and to be honest the thing i remember most was how chris stockberger was the one person that i really knew and i only really knew him because my brother who had been racing in colorado had said his name a handful of times and then lo and behold here's this guy over in in belgium so then fast forward six years and we're at the world tour level together and and i remember going to volta algarve and you're as high as fifth and then you finish in the top 10 and I'm like, dang, this, this TJ is, is not only on one of the best teams in the world. And like, in my mind, top 10 is, is phenomenal for presumably in, in February first stage race of the year. So, I mean, yeah, you've done a great job reframing the, 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 from your perspective, which is in my mind, the, <laughs> the accurate one. Um, <laughs> so throughout your career, you've raced for three three distinct teams which coincidentally all have uh, some sort of abbreviation in them you got you got htc columbia you got bmc and you have ef education first using a single word or single phrase how would you describe each of those teams 
Ooh, um, it's, it's funny because I actually look at BMC, which is where I spent the majority of my career. I spent seven years there. I almost feel like there was a couple of different eras of that team within that same team. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember EF just being fun and lighthearted and, you know, people like everyone got along. All the directors were really, um, they all supported each other. They all supported the riders. I feel like the riders, some of them were, you know, maybe, maybe griping about things like, yeah, I, I should be, I'm underpaid or whatever, but like, you know, it, it was, it was taken over from the T-Mobile era. So some of the contracts were kind of needing to get lived out and like some of the, some of like the, the old era T-Mobile versus the new era HTC. Some of that, some of that was like not, um, you know, some of the elder or like the, the more veteran riders on the team that were crossed over from the, from those two regimes were a little bit at odds with the, with the new way that, that things were done. And, and that's not to insinuate anything like sinister That That was more just like a the rewriting of contracts and like, stuff like that so was that an immediate it, transfer it was, was that did t-mobile go through 2009 and then 2010 was htc was it that close no i mean it, it became it was a little bit before that um because yeah it was columbia in 2008 and nine yeah. I, that was the years that like king Cappy was on the team yeah that's um right. so i think it was 07 was the last year of t-mobile but i was kind of living out like the last couple of years of some of the existing contracts from t-mobile that got taken over by htc so so i remember some of the veteran riders were still kind of having to outlive that sort of old regime yeah yeah which, interesting to me, I was, I, I, I came in and I was like, Hey, this is great. I'm like, I, I just thought everyone got, got kind of equal treatment. Like as a Neo pro, I was getting like wind tunnel tested and I was getting, I, I was getting like all this like great equipment, like DI2, like, oh man, I remember that was the first time I had DI2. I went from mechanical <laughs> shifting to DI2 and I was like, man, this is the business. Like I'm in the future. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, man, I get all this great, this great stuff. Like, um, but I don't know, like, so you, you'd have, it, it, it's weird when asking with like someone coming from the amateurs into a pro team, of course, every day is going to feel like Christmas, you know, um, you'd have to ask some of the older riders what they thought, because I was just kind of wide eyed and bushy tailed and everything was roses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, getting onto BMC, it was a bit. In the beginning, it was kind of like very Cadell centric because he had just won the tour, and uh, and so then it, it it gave this odd perspective because on HTC it seemed like everyone was given equal treatment, everyone was um, everyone was given the same opportunities and the same and, and just kind of the same yeah just just equal treatment and. Uh, yeah, getting onto BMC, it, it it definitely seemed like okay. There's Cadell's program, and it, it it was a team that had just recently come from the Pro Continental hmm. uh, into the World Tour, and Cadell just like won the tour. Oh, that's right. So it, it it had to grow really fast, and it seemed like there was a really good group of core riders, and it was like that was the A team that would follow Cadell around, and everywhere else you almost got like second rate sort of, I, I, look, I gotta be careful because I have like a lot of really good friends there who I, who I really, um, admire and keep in touch with to the, to this day. But as BMC, like through, through the years I was there, the team just seemed to really grow. We brought in Alan Piper and he really professionalized everything and just made everything streamlined. And, um, and we were able to, just kind of feel like a more competitive team throughout all aspects. And uh, as the team grew in its later years, it just seemed like, you know, we had, we could feel like a competitive team everywhere. And, you know, we were really dialed in terms of sports science and altitude camps and this and that. And 
you know, in team time trials, I think it really showed uh, we were, we were just so dominant there. And I think it just showed like in our preparation and our, our camps and like the time and the investment that we would put into all of that. I think it just, uh, it really showed through and just really that aspect of the sport. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it, I, I feel like, yeah. So the simple answer to that question when on BMC was like, it felt like I came into a, a growing program and throughout the seven years I was able to kind of watch it grow mm -hmm. and, and really become what, um, what it was capable of becoming. I mean, we, we were never able to win a grand tour on the team, but uh, I feel like, you know, when we had Richie Port on the team, we were pretty close and, and he, he was definitely capable of it. Um, <clears throat> but no, it was, a, it was a really cool team to be a part of. Nice. Now EF, it, it's just like, it's just pure fun. You know, it's, it's like we had, it was like from one day to the next, I came from being like a guy who on BMC, like Quincy Otto would be kind of the guy who would give me guidance or come to my room and like, say, Hey, I think you got to do this thing. You got to do that. And then all of a sudden from one day to the next, I was looked at as the veteran mm -hmm. and everyone was kind of asking me for advice. And that, that was like this really fun transition where I was like, I was like, wow. I guess I'm not young anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was, but, but we had a, you know, obviously we had an insanely talented team, you know, with like Danny Martinez and Higuita, um and Hugh Carthy. And it, it, I mean, it was just this amazingly talented team where it was like, I think these guys just need to be told how good they are. <laughs> and then, <laughs> uh, no, I, it was, no, it, it was it was really fun. It was it was like it was almost like I was going back to a, an HTC team, but instead of a talented group of like really fast sprinters, it was like a talented group of really fast climbers. Yeah, yeah. It's been a fascinating evolution to watch. Um, I mean, still with a sliver of having been part of it back in 2015, and see what that that team has evolved into. It's it's remarkable. Um, how many riders going into 2022 are older than you are on the roster? Ooh, um, not many. Actually, like Jens Kukler was the only rider who was my age, and I was older than him by like a couple of months. No way. I am trying to think, is there any riders who are older than us? I don't think so. How how old's uh this is out of left field, although on topic. How old's uh Magnus Court Nielsen? Is that his name? Yeah, he's young. Like he's he's like everyone Jeez. always forgets how young he is. He's uh I I don't know off the top of my head, but I could look it up. Okay. Well yeah, unimportant. I didn't know if he was like secretly thirty six years old. Um I, he's one of those riders where people like he's he's you've heard his name for a number of years so you just assume he's old plus he has a big mustache but yeah. he's he's still in his 20s he's like he's like 26 oh that's bananas friggin talented kid these days yeah well terrific answers good summaries there i think that's gonna be a fun history lesson for a lot of folks out there uh okay in an effort to wrap up in one hour, which is generally the goal, I'm going to ask you three very hard-hitting questions. All right. Shoot. What is your favorite place to ride a bike? The Dolomites. Great answer. I love the Dolomites. The Dolomites. Yeah. I, uh, I used to do my altitude camps for the tour every year on top of Paso Gardena. Mm -hmm. And... Oh, it's, man, it's just a stunningly spectacular place. I mean, I know you've done the Giro a couple of times. I know you've gone to that area. It is like every time I go there, it was just, it, it, it's just incredible. And I have a really good memory there from the 2017 Giro. Got a stage win, like kind of right by the place I used to stay. Um, yeah, hands down, favorite place ever to ride a bike was, uh, was the Dolomites. That's perfect. Yeah, mountains there are 
they're they're weird. They're just pillars. They're stunning. They're spectacular. Italy's awesome. Great answer. Um, what is the number one place you would like to ride a bike that you've never ridden? Where do you want to go ride a bike? That I've never ridden? Uh, you know, I hear a lot about um, Hawaii. Huh. Like Maui, like Haleakala is a big thing. Um, and also on the big island, there's that gigantic volcano. Huh. Um I've, I've actually planned a couple of camps there that never ended up happening that uh, I, I've, I've heard so much about it and I hear it's an amazing place, but I've, I've never been around to actually doing it. So I'd, I'd like to check out Hawaii for the riding. It's worth a visit. Uh, I've done Mauna Loa. Mauna Kea is the one that earns all the, the repute because that's the one that has the longest climb, highest climb sea level to summit and then yeah haleakala is its own animal that i've also never i've driven haleakala it's lovely huh. not quite so it's same. good it's worth it's worth checking out dude hawaii is amazing you should go regardless bring your bike or don't okay okay uh, maybe surf there you go yeah go surfing um <laughs> number one person you would like to go for a bike ride with living or otherwise fictitious non who do you want to go for? Ooh, who do I want to go on a ride with? Mm. It's going to have to be a sports. Uh, Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. <laughs> Terrific answer. Um, I bet he's fast. I bet he's competitive. He'd be like, I've never ridden a bike before, but I'm going to try to win. And he'd probably gamble on it too. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Smoking a cigar. <laughs> and somehow find a way to beat me. Yeah. Like. <laughs> Well, shoot, TJ, this has been a pleasure. I, I very much appreciate your time. Um, you've shed some light on on a lot of things, so I appreciate that. It's been a it's been a hot minute. Hopefully, we cross paths sometime in the not too distant future. Yeah, well, let me know if you're ever back in either Girona or California or Colorado or. Hell, maybe I'll go to the East Coast. I mean, Jessica went to UVM. She's been talking about trying to get me to come to Vermont for forever. And we one of these days, we're actually going to pull the trigger on it. Dude, Vermont's amazing. It uh, it snowed a bit today, so I don't know how... I mean, now that you're in retirement, you can embrace the snow. You can do a little skiing. I mean, you've you've lived in all the places. You spent some time in Aspen. You know how to deal with some cold weather here and there. So, yeah. You just have to wear more clothes. It's exactly. not that big deal. Exactly. All right, man. Uh, I won't take any more of your time. It's five o'clock. It's happy hour there. It's awesome to see you. And bon voyage. All right. Thanks, Ted. Take care. <laughs>